Hello, and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll see Moorhead filmmakers Raymond Rea, uh, short film called The Album. But first, joining us now is Susan Weefall, not a stranger to the Prairie Pulse I'm uh, so happy show. to be here again, thank we're, you. We're so happy to have you here, and you're here to talk about your new book, Important Voices, and this is uh, chronicles the history of women elected to statewide office in North Dakota. That's exactly right. So before we get into the book, let the folks know a little bit about yourself, your background, where you're originally from. Well, I grew up in Royal Oak, Michigan, mm -hmm. and attended the University of Michigan like any mm -hmm. good Michigan girl would. <laughs> and then I met my husband, Bob, a defining moment in my life, and he said, will you marry me and move to North Dakota? <laughs> and so, of course, it had to be yes, yes, or the whole thing would have been off. Mm. But he didn't know he had married, he had asked a woman to marry him who really had already been out on the prairies uh, in the Midwest and thought that would be a wonderful place to live. Mm. With that said, obviously, what got you interested in politics? Well, my husband Bob was involved in statewide politics. Mm -hmm. He ran for attorney general from 1980 to 1984. After watching his experience winning and then losing, I decided I would never want to be involved with statewide politics because it was too much work and just, you know, I just saw the whole process. But then I ran for the Bismarck School Board and I had thought that local politics would be my cup of tea. And I won and I was successful and I was elected then president by my fellow board members and so I served for four years on the Bismarck Public School Board. And I really enjoyed that experience. It complemented the professional work I was doing also in other areas. Anyway, and so when um, Governor Schaefer needed to appoint someone to the Public Service Commission, and so that was when Dale Sandstrom was, was, uh, went to the Supreme Court. And so I threw my name into the hat for that appointment with some encouragement. I knew I was going to need to run three statewide elections, you know, in the near future. Um, but I decided that with, I could do this. After watching your spouse do something like that, you learn a lot and you figure if your spouse can do it, you can do it too. So that's where I got my confidence was thinking, if Bob can do this, then I can do it. Okay. So you obviously served as public service commissioner, but then through the years now you've decided to write a book. about. Yes, I did. So why? Why? Because when I was on the commission, I learned that there were only 17 women who had been elected to statewide office in North Dakota. And that amazed me. Here I was one of 17 in 125 years. And as I looked at this closer, I noticed that the first name on the list was Laura Eisenhuth. And not only was she the first person elected to statewide office in North Dakota, superintendent of public instruction, which was the only position a woman could run for at that time in North Dakota, but she was the first in the nation to run for statewide office. And I didn't know anyone in North Dakota who know, knew much about Laura Eisenhuth. I thought she'd be a tremendous person to research and to find out more about. And then that gave me the idea to research the other women in the state as well. Well, tell us a little bit more about that first woman. Laura yeah. came to North Dakota in the eight, late 1880s. She was about 26 years old. She homesteaded on her own. She was a teacher. Uh, after living in Carrington for three years, she met Mr. Eisenhuth and married him. The story of how she got involved in education as, an, as a married woman in North Dakota is interesting because she, um, you know, married women had to stop teaching school. Laura had been teaching for years in Iowa. But they came to her in Carrington and said, well, we our teacher who has been leading our school of 80 students in our one-room school has quit for some reason. And so, would you mind filling in? And Laura said, I said I would. And they came back after two weeks and said, you're doing so splendidly. How about if we hire a housekeeper for you, will you take the job full time? And she said, yes, I will. Well, she so impressed the people in Carrington that they nominated, then the paper went to bat for her to be county superintendent of public instruction. She served, she was elected three times for that position. And then her, they were avid Democrats, and it was a Democrat year that year in the uh, 1990s, a uh, Democrat populist year, and she was on the ticket as state superintendent for the second time. She was elected that time and went on to serve for two years as, as superintendent. Hmm. But you also said that was the only office a woman, a woman yes, could run for. Yes, yes. 
sad, but that's the way our Constitution was set up until, you know, the uh, teens uh, in the 20th century. Mm. She had a wonderful issue. She noticed that she was very concerned about school sanitation, and so she went to bat for children and said, we need to have better and more outhouses. It's ridiculous to have one outhouse for a school of 40 kids. Mm. And so they need to be better taken care of. And although she didn't, wasn't there when they passed that legislation, after she left, it was passed with, in strong support by the next legislature. Hmm, interesting. Well, let's talk about some of the other women. I know you've got a lot in your book, but maybe pick I out do. three or four here to tell us about. Uh, Rosemary Mirdahl wrote a chapter. She's our past lieutenant governor. Rosemary is 88 years old now. And Rosemary wrote about her experiences, among others, of attending Capitol for a day in uh, North Dakota. Ed Schaefer had that program. He designated each month a uh, city in the state or a town that would be capital for a day. She recounts her experiences in doing that, as well as many other things that she did with technology and such, and her role with education. Uh, another one that people may not know as much about is Berta Baker. She has served longer than any other woman in state government here in North Dakota, 28 years. She was served in the, started in the 1920s as state treasurer, went on to serve as state auditor, and served until she was 80 years old. She was um, a widow who had friends in the NPL, and they gave her a job in Bismarck after her husband died and in the treasurer's office, and then they said, you need to run for state treasurer, and she did. And she did a very nice job at it. Wow. Is there, are there any others you can tell us about? Oh my goodness, Emma Bates was interesting in that she was the second woman who served as state superintendent of public instruction. Uh, Emma, um, she beat Laura Eisenhuth. So there was a woman-to-woman -woman race in in the nineteen in the eighteen nineties, and they were both out campaigning all over the state, doing their thing. And Emma came out on top. It was a Republican year that year. Everybody switched. But Emma ran into trouble. Two years later, she did not get renominated by the Republican Party, and she was so mad that she decided to run as an independent. She was not elected, but she wrote a letter to the Fargo Forum and said, I am just fed up with party politics and that they didn't recognize you know, how hard I've been working for the state. It's fascinating the things that these women got into in their political careers back at the very start of women in politics. Well, with that said, talk about some of the challenges uh, these leaders faced uh, while they were in office. Well, Minnie Nielsen faced a real challenge when she arrived in office. Minnie was the third woman to run for superintendent of public instruction. She was the only Republican who was elected in an NPL year in 1918. And so, uh, um, she, when she went to take office, when she went to actually physically take possession of the office the first week, uh, her opponent was so mad that he had been beaten uh, by a woman and, 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 and a Republican at that, and he was the only one who wasn't in the NPL, mm -hmm. that he kept her out of the office for a week and wouldn't let her come in until she got a Supreme Court order. And Bill Langer supported her in that Supreme Court order. Mm -hmm. so. She went on and she did a lot of excellent work with education for adults who were new Americans. And so she uh, set up night schools for people all over the state. She was determined to stamp out illiteracy. And one thing about uh, Minnie was uh, the, one of the st stories that she was told was that there were 13 students attending this one school and uh, for you know people who wanted to learn better English. And here was, Two of the students were people who were members of the school board of that district, but they were German Russians, and they said, we want to learn English to read and write better so that the others can't put anything over on us. Mm. I don't have that German accent, but you can figure <laughs> how they said that. Yeah. Did, did these women, especially running, I guess, maybe against men, but experience prejudice or discrimination? Uh, well, I am sure they did. I, it's hard to be able to spot that as you do mm. the, uh, you know, read what's in the newspaper, as, as you uh, read their own accounts that women have put in. Um, every, I think any woman faced probably challenges uh, to their authority, to their um, competence, you know, as they went along from certain men, not from all men, but from certain men who would say, 
you know, I'm not sure I want to take your opinion on this. Mm -hmm. They could put it in a different way. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, you know, we've talked Republican, Democrat, and, and that, I'm asking this question uh, just in general and hypothetically, sure. as a matter of fact. What would uh, the election for a, a woman, and obviously Hillary Clinton is, uh, you know, out there right now running for president, what would that do in terms of maybe opening doors or kicking down political doors for women? Well, I think it is important. I want to speak apart from Hillary because I just like to talk about a woman serving as president. I think it's very important for our government to have, especially in a democracy, to reflect the diversity of voices, the diversity of the population. And so it's very important for women to have a role in those important jobs. Then it makes everyone feel a part of our government if they can see a lot of diversity within our government. If people want more information or would like to get a copy of the book, where can they go? They can go to Barnes & Noble. Mm -hmm. They can go to the State Historical Society gift shop. They can go to the Institute of Regional Studies at NDSU who published the book. All right. Well, Susan, thanks so much for joining us today. You're we, welcome. We look forward to your next book. Thank you. Thank you. Stay tuned for more. Minnesota State University Moorhead Film Studies professor Raymond Rea is also an award-winning documentary filmmaker. Originally from San Francisco, but now living in Moorhead, Ray's most recent film is an intriguing look at a photo album given to him upon the death of his great uncle, who was gay at the time when it was not safe to be gay in America. Here's Ray's film, The Album. Okay, so you remember the album you gave me of Worries, of Uncle Worries? Uh, yes. Um, why did you give me that album? Because you had a special relationship with Worry, I felt, and you were needed to, you should have something that had belonged to him. It was one of his statements. Do you remember telling me that you were thinking about throwing the album out if you didn't give it to me? Yes, uh, I think it was something that was very much centered on his uh, homosexual life and it wouldn't have appealed to the family that much. Who do you mean by the family? Anybody else in the family? Or? Uh, his immediate family, his sisters and brothers-in-law and whatever. Once upon a time, having a camera in hand implied that one had a certain level of vocation in regards to its usage. It meant you possibly knew how to use a camera, and you would employ that knowledge with a wide range of possible motives. For the non-photographer, it was an arcane knowledge of numbers, equipment, and supplies, all of which would inform one's practice. Socially, it carried some stigma of morbidity. To be a photographer required a slight or great distance from the immediacy at hand of that which was photographed. It was necessary to watch, to calculate, and to engage with the event, whatever it was that was photographed. Looking too much leads to looking too much. It's not healthy. It implies some excess. It leads to pleasures outside the social order. So that's your great uncle, looking very dapper, and I would say that's in the 50s. And all this stuff is, this is in the grove, clearly, these photographs. Crowds and crowds of young gay men uh, cavorting on the beach. Um, these are friends of his. Sturgis Album 2. One of the paradoxes of the snapshot in the family album is that it communicates by way of conventions. We need to recognize it beforehand for it to convey any message. Our experiences are unique, but we can understand them only in relation to others, in our commonalities. But this certainty is relative. 
There is no guarantee that any of us see the same thing faced with the bald fact of a photograph, or that it is understood in the same way. Underlying desires or drives can exist on an invisible plane carried forth in the virtual public forum of the photograph album. These desires and drives are understood by a cabal of the initiated, communicated as if by a secret handshake. Yeah, I heard, I heard that a lot. The people that I interviewed, some of them were young, but most of them were 50s and up. In some cases, very up, you know, late 70s, 80s even. This was in the 1980s. And these people, except for the younger ones, had all lived this life, including the women, where uh, it was don't ask, don't tell. You know, a lot of their relatives knew or suspected or whatever, but it was okay as long as it wasn't said. And a lot of people found that um, more comfortable than out loud and proud. It was like, why do you have to make an issue? And I think they had carved out this life that was pretty satisfying, very satisfying in many cases, and it was an alternative life. And people that I interviewed talked about the normal people and us. You know, we're not, we're not the normal people, we're not normal. And they had come to terms with that. And that's how they built their lives. And they lived double lives. Underlying this was not only satisfaction in the life that they had built, but also a, a terrible fear that if we make an issue of, if we come out, if we push the straight people, if we, you know, we're going to get killed one way or another. That wasn't said, but um, I believe that was there. And Cherry Grove itself exemplifies that because it was so protected. It was, you know, the only way you could have a gay community was if, it, you know, there was a lot of water on both sides. It was hard to get to. The presence of a film camera has its own sociology. Who would use it and for what? Its status as an elite or elitist item made it circulate artistically in a class which would be the most painstaking in its attention to its subjectivity, the upper middle classes.
are grossly maligned, and unjustly so. We want reasonably and sanely to confer with the powers that be to set right these wrongs. We will bend over backward to meet them on their ground. But if we are not heard, we will fight. Our demands are not unreasonable. We are not asking for favors or special treatment, just the rights, and all the rights, afforded the heterosexual. We are still in the asking stage. We will soon reach the demanding stage. This, I love this. This is just the essence of camp here. Wonderful photograph. You know, I'm old enough that I remember when everybody was a homosexual and then gay came in and it was like, and these people who identified as gay were like, oh, those homosexuals, they're so, which is your uncle, your great uncle, those were the homosexuals. And we, gay people, were the, you know, totally different and, you know, so liberated and all, all this. Thing. So then when queer came in, it was like, oh, those gay people are so old hat, you know, and they're so, you know, and we're totally different. We're queer now. And, you know, and to some degree, I feel like it's the same people, just a different name that has somewhat different connotations. <laughs> Well, the reason I know all this stuff is I, I did all this field work and I produced this book, Cherry Grove, Fire Island. I'm very, very proud of this book. I think it's a really good book. And it was um, so a little while ago, uh, the Publishers Triangle did a um, 100 best nonfiction books of the 20th century on a you know, queer topic. And I had two books on that list and this is one of them. And unfortunately, it's gone out of print, and it will be reissued by Duke University Press. If technology imposes a passivity on us to enact ourselves through the camera, there is also the possibility to organize ourselves behind the camera, as it were, while we pose for it. The faces, the scenes, the cut of clothes, styles of a particular time, all of this emerges in retrospect as a reality deemed important enough to record and to preserve in an album. The Warren Sturgis album can be looked at as exemplary of its time, culture, and class. Nothing is overt. It is educated, informed, and skillful. But time erodes the opacity of meanings to allow messages that could be unobserved previously to emerge, and for us to see it differently, as if when painting ages and becomes transparent. Or is that our conceit? What will our perceptions look like in 50 years?
Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse this week. And as always, thanks for watching. Funding for Minnesota Legacy Programs are provided by a grant from the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4th, 2008. And by the members of Prairie Public.